Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 22, Aliens on a New Planet, Fort Lauderdale, with guest Mary McCarty. I'm Mark Kane. The UCA is a bunch of people who've joined together on one simple premise, that the one true God is Yahweh and Jesus is his son, our master, our king, our teacher, the anointed servant of Yahweh, now exalted and placed in charge of all creation. We aren't a church or a denomination. We're just people who agree with that one thing. As a result, there are many other areas we may not agree on, and this was on purpose. The UCA is a service to Unitarian Christians around the world who simply want fellowship, to sing together, pray together, and not be condemned for holding to the literal meaning of Jesus is God's Messiah. If you're new here, welcome. Though maybe you thought this episode is about UFO sightings in southern Florida. Sorry. (laughs) This podcast is more of a lighthearted dance in a field of heresy flowers while singing songs we had to change the lyrics to so they wouldn't be modalist. Mary McCarty dreamed of living by the ocean but she did not anticipate what God actually had in store. (laughs) There was some discomfort. It wasn't sand in her shoes. Mary, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. It's great to be on the famous podcast. (laughs) So you only found out about this podcast a few weeks ago, and then I hear you binged it. I did. I binged, listened to all 18 19? Well, 18 18 or 19, yeah. (laughs) I listened to all of them pretty much back to back in less than a week. Oh my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) What possessed you to do that? (laughs) I just was on fire for the whole subject matter of the Unitarians who used to be Trinitarians and the people who found each other through this UCA network. It was like perfect timing. I had been inundated in a Trinitarian life for a while, and I really was just thirsty for some like-minded dialogue. Yeah. Well, you have a background that was, in fact, Unitarian, similar to mine. Why don't you explain that briefly? So, yeah, I was born in southern western Missouri, south of St. Louis, and my dad was a pastor, Mm -hmm. also the Church of God General Conference. Right. Just grew up in a small congregation where most of the people that went to our church were my relatives. (laughs) Wasn't a very big group. Then we moved to Ohio, and there were a few churches in the Church of God conference there. Mm -hmm. So never really ventured out of my Unitarian life much until just recently. How big was the group (laughs) that you were part of as a child? It ebbed and flowed. I would say the biggest our church was whenever I was pretty young was probably 40 or 50 members. Okay. There were several Sundays, the weather was bad or it was a holiday weekend or something. And and only my grandparents and my mom and dad and I and my sister would show up. Those Sundays were a highlight for me because that meant We weren't having church. We were just going to go to lunch. My grandparents would take us out to dinner. I was always keeping my fingers crossed that no one else would show up. (laughs) So you moved to Ohio. Well, we moved to Georgia for six years and had our last two children and then moved to Ohio and and raised our family. We lived there for 20 years and it was, you know, a lot of like-minded people in our inner circle. We had Mm -hmm. relatives there. Yeah, and there was a Church of God also in that area so that you could continue to attend. Yes, there were actually three different Church of Gods within about an hour mm. from our house. Okay. We went to all three of them at different times because we happened to know the pastors at all three churches. <laughs> it was great. My husband and I both grew up in Unitarian churches. We met at church camp when we were kids. Ah. So we really wanted our kids to have that similar experience. They went to state church camp. They went to national church camp. Um, So you moved several times. What brought you to doing that? uh, My husband's job actually Mm -hmm. moved us both times. And I've always had an adventurous spirit. I think I Might have made a good military wife, except for that my husband would go off to something really dangerous, and that wouldn't have worked out at all. (laughs) But 
what God has always done in my life. He prepares me by making all the things I really loved about living where I live mm-hmm. kind of become sort of a negative. Mm. You know, something's got to give here. There's some annoying things going on. And I think that's just how God starts to stir my spirit. Mm. Like, there's more than this for you. Okay. And we've always raised our kids to just be adventurous. We've gone whitewater rafting and nearly all died. And, oh, no. <laughs> uh, you know, they've gone on missionary trips and driven rattly old vans halfway across the U.S. and they rock climb and they've jumped out of airplanes. So, oh man, our kids have taken our my adventurous spirit and they've multiplied it tenfold. And they do things that terrify me that I wish I didn't know about. <laughs> so, moving was was fun. You know, in the back of my mind, I always trusted that God had a plan to use us mm. where He was moving us to. So, so how does this adventurous spirit manifest in the next stage of your life? So our kids grew up, we found ourselves to be empty nesters. We both hated our jobs as we were dropping off our youngest in grad school, nine hours away. (laughs) And on the way back home, I said, wouldn't it be crazy if we just went home, you quit your job that has you working seven days a week, Mm. and we just moved to Florida. (laughs) Would that be crazy? And my husband was like, let's do it. (laughs) Oh, wow. Why Florida? We had been there on vacation Mm. at least once a year for like a dozen years. Okay. It was just always a dream of mine. I hated to leave every time we were there on vacation, and I just felt so just close to God and relaxed. I felt young and youthful and energetic and happy, and I thought, I wonder if I lived there, Mm. if I would still feel that way or if— if it would go away after a couple of weeks. So there's no way to know other than to move there. Other than so, quit your job and go. <laughs> so, yeah, our kids were all for it. <laughs> yeah. They were like, that'd be great. We can come visit you guys at the beach. And <laughs> our family in Ohio may not have thought it was the best idea. I think people thought we were having like a joint midlife crisis together. <laughs> and it just felt, I mean, uh, maybe I don't know the voice of God and maybe I don't understand how he leads, but it really felt like he was just opening every door as we needed it to open. Mm, Our yeah. youngest was 24 at the time and we were ready Yeah, to just have some downtime and relax and just go live in paradise. <laughs> that was our plan. You were ready. Where did you select for your destination? Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> we had been all around Florida, but that was like my favorite little spot. We just said, well, let's just put all the things we own that we've accumulated over the past 30 years of marriage, let's just put them in a storage unit and just go stay in somebody's Airbnb for a week and sort of check it out. <laughs> <laughs> we had no plan. We had no jobs. Oh, um, I, I just felt God had a plan for us. I thought his plan was, Mary, you need some relaxation time, and I'm just going to comfort you here at the beach. (laughs) We thought we were escaping all of our troubles for this paradise, but we had a lifetime of baggage from our childhoods and our marriage to sort through. Mm. We never really had time to delve into those things before because we were so busy just raising a family. Mm. I think that that was part of God's plan too. We really needed to get rid of a lot of our heaviness that was weighing down our relationship. And Mm. it's not until you slow down that you realize what's really going on whenever you give yourself time to talk to each other. Mm. That's cool. And then um, God introduced us to people who were nothing like anyone we had ever met before. Mm. We felt like aliens on a new planet (laughs) because the people that we met immediately, when we got down there, we rented an Airbnb that got five-star reviews. Okay. The people had a boat on the water. Mm. And when we got there, it was a gay couple who had been together for 25 years, two men. Okay. Then when we got there, we thought, We're not so sure because we've never really had close gay friends that we spent a lot of time with. Immediately, we were just enamored with their personalities. They were just hysterical, just very outgoing. One of them was super flamboyant. He was a hairdresser. He immediately (laughs) started doing my hair and 
<laughs> you know, took us out on a wild boat ride. We ended up in downtown Fort Lauderdale. It was a grand adventure just living with them for a week. And we realized right away that this was a completely different world that we were in. Mm. The next week after we moved there actually was Christmas. Ah. We didn't know a soul down there. Yeah. And so our only friends was this gay couple that we met. Yeah. And we had since found an apartment that was right next door to the street they lived on. Yeah. And so they insisted that we come to their house for Christmas. Oh. Okay, well, that's going to be totally different than our Midwestern <laughs> family Christmases we've had. It might be. And it ended up being a really good time. There was a lot of talk of God and Jesus. We had a big circle group prayer before our meal, and mm. we got to know a lot of their friends. And the people that we found ourselves sharing Christmas with that year were people who were a lot more similar to us than what we realized because they were kind of escaping their past life. They were looking for a new start in life, and they didn't have anywhere else to go on Christmas either. Huh. And when you say escaping their life, you're not not like escaping the Midwest. No, they just, you know, they all had a past. Ah. Most of them were from the gay community, and they had been kicked out of their families, disowned, bullied. Okay. So they all had heart-wrenching stories to tell. Mm. We really liked them. We really felt called to be their friends. Mm. But then we had all these questions like, is it okay to be good friends with this pretty big group of like a gay community here in Fort Lauderdale? And Fort Lauderdale has has a large okay. LGBTQ plus. <laughs> it's all it's all represented. Mm -hmm. We didn't really know what to do with all that. It's like, God loves everyone. Does God want us to be friends with these people? And we just kept getting introduced more and more to friends of their friends. And they loved having us in their life. They had never really been friends with people like us in their mm -hmm. lives either. So they were just as intrigued with us being friends with them as we were ourselves being friends. So w what did they think of you? I mean, Midwest? Yeah, I think they thought that we probably weren't going to be as friendly or want to be friends with them. Mm. They knew pretty quickly that I was a pastor's daughter and that we had been together since high school. We had three kids and we just had this kind of typical Midwestern American life yeah. and that we were coming down here to be like crazy adventurists. <laughs> they thought it was quaint and cute that <laughs> this was our big adventure in life, but we loved them. We really bonded right away with them mm. and we were very confused by the whole thing. Is this what God wants us to do? Like, are we supposed to be friends with people who... We've always thought our whole lives were kind of the worst of the worst, mm. you know, like these are people who are directly opposed to God's commands of how he wants people to live. And so how do you be friends with that and still be a Christian? Yeah. Do you accept yeah. that lifestyle? Do you, you know, try to convince them that what they're doing is wrong? How do we approach this subject? <laughs> you and Paul probably had a lot of late night discussions about your experiences. Yeah, like immediately one of the guys was just like Paul's best friend. And his best friend in Ohio was like this really macho pro football player guy who they used to golf together and work on cars. They were always grease monkeys laying in the garage, like <laughs> taking heater cores out of our teenagers' cars together. And <laughs> Now his new best friend is like this flamboyant hairdressing gay guy who <laughs> just just loves Paul, you know? Oh. He's like, Paul's my new best friend. Oh, wow. And so Paul would talk to his friend in Ohio and be like, well, I replaced you. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just comical. And we were just like, we were up for whatever. <laughs> we just know we want to live by the beach and God will just introduce us to people he wants us to meet. Okay. I went and got a job. I really wasn't interested in going back to work in an office like I had been doing for a decade. Uh, Wouldn't it be awesome if I could work like down at the beach somewhere and 
feel the ocean breeze and get a little sand in my shoes. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, this little town that we lived right by had a bunch of restaurants down by the beach. So I'm going to go down there and see if I can try to convince those people that I can work at a restaurant, even though I never have. <laughs> I started at one end and just kept getting job applications at each restaurant. Mm -hmm. It was like, go fill out this application and come back tomorrow at such and such time. And I made it almost around the circle to one of the last places. And when I walked in, they said, oh, just sit right here and the owner will come talk to you. Hmm. I thought, oh, I'm not really ready for that. How am I going <laughs> to convince him that I should be a server at a restaurant? Yeah. So this guy who seemed like he was in the Italian mafia <laughs> sat down and probably said several cuss words. I don't remember exactly how the conversation went, but he was really <laughs> gruff. Yeah. And I had just answered a few brief questions and he said, so... You never really worked in a restaurant. You don't really have any experience. I'm like, no, not really. What do you want to work here for? I was like, well, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I just thought it sounded like it would be fun. I like people and I like Italian food. So he was like, how about this? We're really desperate. So how about you come work tomorrow? You can work for the weekend. If we like you, fine. If you like us, fine. If not, we'll just part ways. Okay. That was the only place that said, we'll give you a job. So I thought, well, yeah. I'll try it. And I was kind of talking to God like, are you sure you want me to work for this Italian mafia dude? I'm not too sure. The place was one of the more rowdy on the block. They had live music every night. It had a huge bar in the middle of the Italian restaurant. Mm. It was a hopping, happening joint. And it seemed like a really fun place to work. But when I got there, I realized that it was all young people who were great servers who knew what they were doing or older people who were my age or older who had been serving for like 20 or 30 years. Wow. There was no one like me. You know, I stuck out like a sore thumb. Here's this older woman who has never served before <laughs> and I knew nothing about wine, knew nothing about how to order a drink from a bar. I was supposed to make espresso and cappuccino with this Italian imported coffee and do the little foam stuff on top. I'm like, I don't know how to do one thing in this whole place. But they liked me for some reason. I was nice. We had a good time and they let me stay. Mm. <laughs> and I thought, God, are you sure you really want me here? I don't seem to really fit in with anything. I don't speak Italian like everyone else here does. Mm. I don't even know if I have the energy. So, so that had to be unique for them then. Yeah. You are the, you are the oddball in the whole group. What how did that interaction go? I tried to just keep an open mind and just say a little prayer before work and a lot during work. You know, God, if this is where you want me to be, help me learn what I'm supposed to learn here. Help me be used by you to speak life into these people or to just give them whatever it is that I have to offer. Okay. I prayed a lot while I was serving because it was the hardest job I have ever done. Mm. It was very challenging, very exhausting mentally and physically. But when we were back in the back, we would just talk about our lives most of the people there had come from some kind of a broken background. They had run away from home. They had just got out of rehab. They were from some other country and, you know, trying to work at the only place that wouldn't check their background. Mm. They wouldn't pass a drug test. I mean, it was just a plethora of people that I had never been around. Wow. So this was kind of like a second chance place mm. for people who were felons. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it was mind boggling. Almost everybody there had not succeeded in society. Wow. A lot of them, this was sort of their last ditch effort before they had to go back home and come crawling back to their families and say, I tried to make it on my own and I couldn't. Mm. It was a lot of opportunity to give advice to people, but I didn't want to come across as sounding like I have my life together and none of you do. Mm. That was not where my heart was at all. Okay. I felt like I had just as much to learn from them about their experiences in life as 
I could teach them. So because I'm a talker and because I have a kind heart and I genuinely enjoy conversation with people about their lives, we would always get into deep conversations and they would ask me for advice and help and direction. Mm. Um, I would always bring up something about church or God or, you know, my past and things just to kind of see if that would go anywhere. Most of my coworkers just really would seek out friendship and support and comfort from Mm. me, which I found, you know, kind of shocking because Mm. I didn't think that they would have any use for my type in that place. But they would ask me to pray for them. They would cry to me about how they wish they had a mom like me. It was just very touching. Almost every day I would cry on my way home from work just thinking about a story that one of my coworkers had shared with me. Several times it'd be a slow day during lunch and I would just feel led by God to just give the money I made to my fellow coworker who didn't make enough to be able to take the bus home that day and then come back to work the next day and also buy supper for her daughter at home, you know? So Mm. I don't say that to make it sound like, you know, I'm a saint or anything. Mm. It's good to think about how God put people in my life in that one little tiny restaurant. It seemed like I had hundreds and hundreds of interactions with people like that, where God just spoke to me and said, Mm. you're there for my purpose, not for your purpose. Well, that's cool. It sounds like you got pretty close to these people. I mean, you became their oddball Midwest friend. Yeah, there was um, several people that I'll be friends with the rest of my life. We would go to the beach together on our days off and They didn't have a car, some of them, so I would take them grocery shopping, or they didn't have a washer and dryer, and doing laundry was very expensive down by the beach communities where all the vacationers are. Mm. Cost of living is pretty high. Yeah. So I would do laundry. I cut a couple guys' hair, even though I (laughs) I don't even really know how to cut hair. But they just assumed these things of me, you know? (laughs) <laughs> like, you probably know how to cut hair, right? Can you give me a haircut? Like, I don't know. Yeah, I guess. So, <laughs> but one of the guys that is a super good friend of mine now, and and hopefully he's going to come and visit me this summer. He was an elderly gay gentleman who had been single for quite a while because his partner died of AIDS mm. like 10 years ago. He was one of the most kind-hearted and giving, loving people I've ever met in my life. We were instant friends. The moment that we met each other, it was just like long lost friendship. We just instantly connected. And I don't think he's ever had a friend like me. I've never had a friend like him. Mm. And he would always ask me questions about my life and remember every little detail, what my kids' names were, where they lived, who they were married to, what they were doing in their lives, and just really develop a genuine, sincere friendship. Mm. It was that relationship with him that really caused me to go deep into a conversation with God, like, how am I supposed to love someone who doesn't believe what I believe or doesn't see the world the way I see the world? Not that I'm right about everything, but I've I've read the Bible, and I know there are things in there that say, don't do this and don't do that. And God started to work on my heart like, I love all of my children, and it's okay for you to have this man as your best friend down here. He needs to be loved just as much as you need to be loved, and I brought you guys together so that you can love on each other Hmm. and you can help each other get through life that is hard. And it's just kind of that simple. Hmm. And so, I don't know. It was just one of those things that happens in life that makes you pause and and think, what do I do with this situation? You know, I've I've never encountered this experience in my life. Hmm. It was just part of the spiritual journey that it's okay to love people who are broken and different 
Mm. And I couldn't wait to get to work and work with him. Huh. It was more of a time of friendship than it was work when we were together. Mm. Not what you expected, Mary. No. <laughs> I would have never drawn out a plan and, and had this be my Florida plan. <laughs> you know, I just wanted to live by the beach. That's all. <laughs> Nothing else. Oh. So while you were there, you probably sought out some sort of a Christian fellowship as well. Yeah. Pretty soon after we moved in to our apartment, we were just researching churches that were around the area. We really wanted to find a church close by that we could maybe be a part of a Christian community and mm -hmm. possibly make some friends that we could hang out with. Of course, we knew any church that we went to was going to be Trinitarian. <laughs> yeah. And so... We just swallowed hard and decided, we'll just go for it. We'll just check it out mm -hmm. and see if it's anything we would even be able to sit through at all. Yeah. So we found a church. Couldn't find the church when we actually went to the building. It wasn't where we thought it was. And then we were just going to go to brunch. We're already looking cute, smelling good. Let's just <laughs> have a little date. And then we thought, well, wait a minute. Yeah. Maybe there's a church service on the way home that's kind of starting around this time. So I typed into my maps on my phone, church. I was thinking, how do I word this? Like, church is on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> so up came the name of this church that just happened to be 20 minutes away, and it had a service starting in 20 minutes. So I said, well, maybe God wants us to go to this church. We pulled in, and it was, it was what I would consider a mega church. Thousands of people in each service five or six services each weekend. Oh, man. We thought it was an outlet mall or something. <laughs> and what struck me first was people were scurrying in at the last minute, like people do for church everywhere. Yeah. As we looked across the parking lot, it was such a cross-section of humanity. Every race, ethnic group, socioeconomic diversity was all represented in that parking lot. Wow. We just thought, well, this is cool. <laughs> of course, this is nothing like our Midwestern church experience. Really? <laughs> so we came in and the music was rocking and hopping. Mm. There were big screens and big decorations, and it was like a Christian theater production. Wow. We were just like in awe. The music was so loud. The people on the stage were just dancing and jumping, and it <laughs> yeah. looked like a urban hip-hop sort of group. Nothing like what we had ever been to, ever, in our lives. We were literally blown away. Wow. I don't know. I guess just being a pastor's daughter, I'm just used to anything at church, whatever. I was at church so much in my life that yeah. I could sit and listen to discussions on deep theological ideas and not get bored. But so I kind of let my husband decide if he wanted to go back. And he was like, I love this place. I, I want to come back here again. And we really found ourselves looking forward to it. Like, what is this crazy church going to do this week? <laughs> so probably the second or third time we went, we walked out into the lobby and there happened to be someone standing there with small group opportunities. And she made eye contact with us and sort of lured us in with her smile, like, hey, you guys want to be a part of a small group? And we were both like, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Does it matter if we don't believe anything you guys believe? You know, <laughs> I don't know if this is going to work out, but yeah. we'll give it a try, mm. you know. All right. So they just happened to have a couple's Bible study that involved food. Oh. So they had us with the promise of being fed. And then you break up into the guys go one way, the girls go another way, and you do these small groups. Well, when we got there the first week, the small group of ladies I was in was pared down to only 40. Only 40? Only 40 in my small group. Hmm. And most of them were all island ladies who were from Jamaica, Dominican Republic, Cuba. Again, I felt like an alien, you know? <laughs> Yeah. How did I end up in a small group with a bunch of ladies from the islands? Yeah. And then in our group of 40, there probably was two or three white ladies and everybody else was, you know, something else. Yeah. It was cool. I really was looking forward to 
another aspect of our adventure, just being exposed to completely different cultures. The food they had was amazing. They brought in all this island cuisine every week. Mm. We started really loving Jamaican food. Yeah. But I knew that the subject of the Trinitarian belief could get dicey. Mm. And I wondered how this was all going to be sorted out. Yeah. I'm still trying to get my mind around. Your small group is about twice the size of your actual church growing up. But Yeah. So <laughs> so did you stay with this group then for the couple years that you were down there and they became your friends? Yeah. It was one of the types of book studies where you had a book written by a Christian author that was biblically based mm -hmm. and you worked through the book for like like a semester at a time. And so the book that they chose just happened to be a book that was speaking directly to my life at the time. Oh. And I would tell the ladies, the reason we're doing this book is because this is exactly what I needed. <laughs> and they would all agree, well, we needed to, but it just felt like God was using this group to really bring me along on this spiritual journey and really connect with Him. Hmm. I guess the subject of doctrinal differences didn't really come up for a while. I wanted to really just be there as like an observer. I found these ladies to be very serious Bible studying women. Mm. They knew their scripture. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, they've always looked at the Bible through the lens of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. You know, when the subject would come up, you know, Jesus being the Son of God, or, you know, there'd be scriptures where it'd be talking about the difference between God and Jesus, and maybe me or one of the other members of the group would ask a question about clarification. It always was a long, drawn-out, confusing description of the Trinity. As that went on, I, I finally got the nerve up to say, I wasn't raised in a Trinitarian church. This is new to me. So can you help me understand, you know, what the Bible's saying here? I really wanted to hear what they would say. Okay. And so some of the other women who were new to the church, we had a, a lady who was Catholic who just wanted to come to the Bible study just because she wanted to be around a group of women. Hmm. We had a Jewish lady who had decided that she believed that Jesus really was the Messiah. Oh, wow. But she had never been brought up in a Christian church, certainly not a Trinitarian church. Right. So this was her first experience with Christianity at all. We had a young college-age girl who was just new to religion okay. because she had come from a really messed up home. So she was just wanting to come to church to try to find some direction in her life. Okay. So when I would ask my questions... People like that in the group would say, yeah, I am I wonder the same thing. And so <laughs> after they would describe it in the Trinitarian way, we would all sort of look at each other and just kind of furrow our eyebrows. And <laughs> sometimes I would ask a follow-up question to try to clarify. So Jesus is the Son of God, like it says in this passage, right? Well, yeah. Okay, well, I just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> and God is the Father of Jesus. Yeah, okay. So, huh. as the time went on, I, I was in this Bible study for over a year. Mm. They got to, to understand that I was going to be asking a lot of questions. Yeah. And I was a little bit of, not really a troublemaker, but I wasn't afraid to ask the hard questions but they accepted the fact that I came from a different background, even mm. though I didn't really take the opportunity to get up on my soapbox and, and proclaim all the differences of my beliefs. Yeah. Because I really didn't feel like that was respectful because we were going to a Trinitarian church. It was our choice to do that. Mm. But I did want to get people thinking. Yeah. When we decided that we were going to have to leave Florida— they went so far as to have a special prayer meeting on a, a separate night than what they usually gather just for Paul and I so that they could pray for us and offered to help us move if we needed it and pack. 
And then after we moved, they still contacted us and wanted to stay a part of our lives. Wow. uh, Which I found to just be so sweet. It was a very positive experience overall. Yeah. Well, a lot of folks think of megachurches as impersonal, large, uh, you're just like a number, nobody will know who you are. That isn't what you're describing here. You're describing something that sounds like like a church, yeah. except it was just a part of a church. Yeah, I think that was shocking to us as well. We were expecting to just sort of go have our ears tickled and be entertained by this amazing theater production. Mm-hmm. We weren't expecting to make a soul connection with people. And we did find great lasting friendships there in this huge church. Mm. I wasn't expecting to grow in my understanding of God in a church full of Trinitarians, but I did. Yeah. In your account of the Sunday school class where you would ask the question and then you noticed there were other people who joined you, I'm, I recall an experiment that they did some time back where they'd get a room full of people. It was all staged and one person was actually the test subject, but he didn't know it. And they would hold up a card with lines of different lengths. And their question was about which one was a certain length. And the whole room would answer wrong. And the one kid being tested, he would start going along with the whole room because he felt awkward. And then they changed it slightly. They added one other person in the experiment who would also answer correctly so that this guy wasn't alone. And for the most part, that's all it took. That experiment stuck in my head. I've used it in discussing things with my kids. Sometimes we just need to have one of those people there. In this case, it was just one other person who would answer the question correctly, and now the person felt confident. So I don't know what lasting effect you had there, but your asking the questions may have been just the thing that those other five or six people that you knew about, and maybe even a you know dozen more, helped them to see, okay, I'm not the only one who thinks this is weird. Look, she's asking these questions. You know, it was not even confrontational. You didn't have to create, you know, an uproar, get booted out of the group. You could just keep asking questions and looking at each other and chatting and being friends with people. And they're like, huh, so not everybody is all in (laughs) on this Trinity thing. And you were there doing that. That's just cool. Yeah. I think it was a mature enough situation. And we were all genuinely seeking the truth. Maybe God softened their hearts and their spirits a little bit to be okay with me questioning something that they were so sure about. Yeah. And what's strange is that a few times they asked me to lead some of our group studies. Oh, wow. And I was like, are you sure? (laughs) (laughs) So I tried to still bring up you know, my understanding of scripture, but not say it in a way that would be disrespectful to them. Like, Mm. I don't believe this, but I do believe that. What's interesting is if I just stated the fact that, you know, Jesus was the son of God, he was human, I wouldn't get any arguments because he can't really argue with that. Yeah. They would just, you know, just roll right along with it. Like, yeah, (laughs) that's true. I just found it interesting that I found reason to disagree with them because they took my belief and they took it 10 steps further and wound it up into something that was like a man-made thought. Mm. But there was no way that they could really argue against my non-Trinitarian speech because it was biblical. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) What I was saying was not controversial at all. I was just stating a Unitarian view and they were like, yeah, that, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's strange. So you didn't have people like raise their hands. It's like, no, wait a minute. When you say Jesus is the son of God, you mean he's the son of God? And you're like, yep. <laughs> yeah. No. Some of the women were very, very well versed on their doctrinal beliefs, but that was only a handful in the group. I would say the majority of the people in the group were not 100% sure how this all worked out. Like, no one really could ever describe the Trinity to any of us in a way that sounded easy to understand and believable. You know, 
to try to describe God is impossible for our human brains to understand. Yeah, and yeah. through much sanctification and growing in the spirit, then you'll just have to come to accept that we won't ever on this side of eternity be able to yeah. understand this concept. Right, right. And then I would usually say something to the effect of, so I believe God is the Father. I believe Jesus is his son. I believe the Holy Spirit is the power of God at work in our lives. And they were all like, yep, that's true. <laughs> so my words were not offensive to them. I just didn't take it to the next level of description to say they're all three in one. Or yeah, you stuck with what the scripture says and left off the parts that it doesn't. And it worked out just fine. Mm -hmm. You know, many of those people there probably haven't had Unitarian Christians in their lives. A lot of people think, oh, the Unitarian Christians, you mean like the crazy ones? Mm -hmm. They have these conceptions of people who, you know, they have their own versions of the Bible or they throw out mm -hmm. whatever, you know, they're told ideas of what these people are like. And here you got to be there for more than a year and make connections with these people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they came to understand you had a different perspective, but they also saw you made sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, talk about a positive experience for them. It's just fun to think you had one more opportunity to be a positive influence in people's lives. You know, your neighbors, you had people you worked with, and then you had your people at church where mm -hmm. they saw a Unitarian Christian who makes sense when she reads her Bible and seems very sincere. <laughs> at, the, at the restaurant, they saw a Midwestern person who they would have maybe expected to be, you know, oh, very standoffish or you people are all whatever you are, I'm not going to talk to you. And you became friends. That's very cool. <laughs> yeah, we thought so. It was totally different than what I expected when we moved to the beach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was way better than anything I could have planned. It was way more fun than just sipping mimosas on the beach and putting your toes in the <laughs> water and listening to the ocean waves. It was, it was like... Um, Faith in motion. Mm. God was just exposing us to what life can be if you get out of your comfort zone uh. and you just sort of put away the desire that you think you should have for material things or even building up a nest egg for your children to inherit as the most important thing you can do in your life. Yeah. You know? And that's what we've always been stressed out about in our former life mm. before this big adventure redirected our thoughts. It was like, you have to have a 20-year plan, 30-year plan. You know, you have mm. to prepay for your funeral arrangements and find a little church and stay in it and do vacation Bible school. And that's the important things in life. Mm. And we just were just wanting to feel alive and to feel like God could use our whole life and not just our church on Sunday morning or our commitment to being junior church teachers in July. Yeah, We just really needed that spiritual awakening. And I feel like by God uprooting us and sending us into this alien world, we learned that truth is not the only important thing. Truth and love is mm. what we should have in our spiritual walk. I had a lot of truth. I don't know that I really had exposure to the love of God's children until we moved to Florida. And then I really learned how to love people that I may have thought were unlovable in my hoity-toity, I'm kind of holier than thou attitude. Mm. God can use me in every situation, and He can bring people into my life, and we can get through this life together, connect with each other, and hopefully plant seeds that will lead each other closer to God, and we can still make a difference yeah. in the lives of people, even if it's a momentary difference. Mm. You might be the only Christian that some of those people ever really know. Maybe, yeah. Well, that is quite a tale. It is. I, I, you didn't stay. You ended up leaving Fort Lauderdale eventually. Yeah, we ended up leaving, and had we not gone to Florida, we would have never ended up where we are now because we had to 
unpack some baggage. We had to let go of some preconceived ideas of what was important in life. We felt the calling to move back to Missouri and take care of my husband's elderly parents mm. who weren't doing very well. Okay. And after just going on this adventure and packing up everything in a U-Haul truck, and <laughs> it seemed very reasonable for us to just throw everything in the back of a U-Haul truck and drive to Missouri and put it all in storage again and move in with his parents. Mm. So... We're learning lessons in a totally new and different way now because it's a completely 180 degree different <laughs> environment here now. <laughs> yeah. But that's okay. This is our next chapter. Mm. And we have no idea what's going to happen in five years, 10 years. We've learned not to make plans in our life. We've learned that God is going to take us where he wants us to be um, and where we can be used. That's cool. We didn't know that before. Now we do. Well, Mary, thank you so much for sharing your story. I love it. I appreciate your time. I really do. Thank you. One of the most delightful aspects of these podcasts have been the opportunity to vicariously experience the lives of other Unitarian Christians. Most of us have a small circle, our family, friends, and church, many of us don't get too far from home. <laughs> Frankly, we tend to live in bubbles of people who think like we do. For encouragement and support, this is good. But there is more to it than that. Something about going into all the world. Mary, as we spoke, my mind would wander back to that moment when the prostitute cried on and anointed Jesus' feet. She sought him out. She exposed herself to the jeers of the Pharisees who were there that day just to approach Jesus in love. We don't know the backstory of that scene in Luke 7, but I suspect it may have been something like this. Jesus had spent some time in the area, and during his teaching, this woman was present. Jesus spoke to her with love giving her a kind of attention she did not get from others. In her profession, she was used and overlooked. But Jesus was different. His gentle words cut deep into the darkest pain of her life. But that cut didn't damage her further. It released the shame. It began the healing. Her future was changed from a life of desperation into a life of hope. Appreciation for this man consumed her. She determined to return to him with perfume. She hears word of where he is at the Pharisee's house and overcome by appreciation and sheer determination to express her gratitude, she walks right in, undaunted by the piercing eyes of those who knew what kind of person she was. Email feedback to podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org. I love to hear your voices, so click on the record link in the show notes or the one on the podcast webpage, podcast.unitarianchristianalliance.org. If you aren't a member of the UCA and, assuming you are a Unitarian Christian, help others by joining. You can join for free. You can also be a supporting member and give a small donation each month or each year. Some of those funds will help cover costs for the first annual UCA conference being planned now for the fall. We'll announce more when the details are ready. So please, do consider joining UnitarianChristianAlliance.org. You'll even get a spot on the membership map on your very own postal code. People in your area can find you, or you can find them. Many UCA members are isolated and some may still be hurting from the fallout of making a very hard decision in favor of truth. Maybe you can be the alien on their planet. Visit, love, share of yourself, and let God surprise you like he did Mary. Thanks, Mary. Your story gave me so much to ponder. Our God is clever, 
and you got to experience it firsthand. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well.